Welcome to another edition of, uh, and now the actual news with Bill Amos. I guess I'm a little nervous because I haven't talked to my, my dear friend here in person for a long, long time, probably more than 30 years. And it's uh, Wendy Mesley. Oh, hello. Been... How are you? Hi. Oh, it's so, I can see your face. It's so nice to see you. And uh, yeah, it brings back lots of memories of I guess mostly our time in Montreal. I'm not. People think I'm from Montreal, and I'm, I'm not. I'm from Toronto, but it was a it was a pretty profound time to be there, and and uh, shared a lot of it with you. Yeah, absolutely. I I was trying to think when I first saw you, and I think it was at a press conference, um, in, uh, that Rene Levesque was having, in, on on some vacant lot in Longueuil, which is south. Yeah, of I remember the first time I saw him because growing up in Toronto, it was you know Pierre Trudeau was the the big guy then, and there was all this talk about bilingualism, and there was this guy who was threatening to break up Canada, and I got offered a job to with CBC, which I loved, mm -hmm. uh, but it was to go somewhere that I didn't find that interesting, and CTV offered me a job in Montreal. And I thought, don't you have to be bilingual? And they were like, well, just say you're bilingual. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, I was eventually sort yes, of, but, yes. uh, uh, but yeah, I remember the first time seeing him and thinking he's wearing blue suede wallabies. What kind of terrorist <laughs> wears blue suede wallabies? <laughs> yeah. And the constant, the constant puff of smoke, right? The constant. Yeah. Well, I remember in James Bay, him like eating soup with where there was some opening of some you know dam or something and him eating soup with one hand and smoking with the other oh was yeah just always oh, yeah. in the other hand yeah and and anytime you went to a pq meeting like at the uh they always had them at the paul sylvie arena in montreal and the, the place was full of smoke so if you were a non-smoker it was very very uncomfortable i smoked yeah so, I so, love so did smoking. i yeah i don't but, smoke anymore i hope i stopped in time <laughs> yeah no kidding i stopped in the 80s but uh yeah, it's been a long time. So you got a new venture coming up. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, when I left CBC, I guess about, well, it was a long, uh, it was like almost two years ago, but it, it took forever to resolve. That's another story. Yes. But uh, when I when I first left, uh, people were saying, oh, are you going to write a book? And I was like, well, I would, except that the stories that I would tell would get me in more trouble and I'm not really looking for trouble right now. Uh, and also I have like no memory and no archives and no, you know, no fabulous bits of interviews with fabulous people. And then people said, well, why don't you do a podcast? And I was like, I don't know. That means giving over control to some other company or making no money. And it's a lot of work. So I just let everything go. And then my friend Maureen Holloway uh, ended up uh, leaving CHFI in her morning show mm -hmm. and uh, we're like really good friends and she's really funny and I'm a trained journalist and we both think that we're in charge um, <laughs> yeah but we but we work stuff out so it's uh, we decided to do this my husband actually came up with the idea for the podcast which is women of ill repute which is uh, not a comment on anything recent that happened to me. It's something that I've always felt like that. And I've always yeah. covered, I, I, I've always identified with, with underdogs and fighting for people. And, and I think that most women and probably a lot of men see themselves as someone of ill repute because they, mm -hmm. they fought for something. So to us, mm -hmm. it's, it's a compliment. And it's also a bit saucy, which is what I've really always been underneath the that's CBC true. veneer. <laughs> yes, that's true. So yeah, so we started doing this podcast together and, uh, and, and we're launching and we've talked to a whole bunch of uh, uh, interesting women who we admire for various reasons and to various degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're all women who have like broken a few eggs along the way because they didn't like the rules, didn't think the rules were appropriate or, you know, like Jody Wilson-Raybould fought against things. Yes. And she taped a civil servant and uh, was thrown yeah. out of caucus and uh, Mary Walsh was uh, pissed off so many people in this country. So those are the first two that we're <laughs> launching and yeah. other people like that, like big time restaurant owners and uh, Mary Hannon, who's probably the most famous lawyer, uh, criminal defense lawyer in the country. She did this young Gomeshi thing, which is yes. very controversial. Very. So just, yeah. So just mm -hmm. women who are really smart, who you can find, you can have whatever opinion you want, but we just, we're not, scumbags we're not really interested in, but. Uh, no, no. You don't <laughs> but other than that, them, we are, no. yeah. Well, it sounds terrific, and it's uh, launching uh, on uh, June 20th, I think. 
Yeah. So Monday. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it'll be up there and then we'll be every two weeks for as long as we can keep it up or until we get until bags of money drop from the sky, (laughs) um, which we're still hoping for. So yeah, we'll see, we'll see what happens, but so far it's, we have some help from Matt Kundal of uh, Sound Off Communications in Winnipeg. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, it's it's me and Maureen basically doing all the chase, all the research, coming up with all the ideas, reading all the books, doing all the interviews, recording the interviews and sending them to Matt. So it's a lot of work, as you would know, but uh, yeah. a lot more work than we thought it would be. But yeah. uh, but it's fun. It's interesting. Well, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a terrific, uh, a terrific podcast. And I'm sure it's going to do very, very well because you still have uh, a lot of fans and a lot of people uh, that support you and uh, and uh, you know wish you well. But the well, woman- Marine does too, right? Like she's yeah. uh, we're in two very different worlds. Like she's she did a morning talk show and it wasn't like a newsy talk show. It was a hey, what's happening in the world kind of. Uh, uh, so she talks a lot about pop culture and she's really funny. Like she was a comedian, so she mm-hmm. knows you know mm-hmm. so much more about improv and all that stuff than I do. And my training, as you know, is as a very serious journalist. So at one point she was calling me Ernest and I was like, stop calling me Ernest. That means I have no sense of humor, like back off. And she's like, oh, OK, well, let me think of a better word. So we're we're still trying to to work out things. Mm-hmm. But uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, she's got um, sort of the private radio world that she's so well known. And I've got the sort of CBC crowd. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're hoping to we're hoping to figure out whether we're a comedy show or a serious journalism show or somewhere in between. Well, the women of ill repute, you wrote you wrote a very interesting article in The Globe uh, a little while ago about uh, your childhood and and, uh, you know, how that, you know, that phrase sort of surrounded your your upbringing and your mom and so on. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about that where 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 did wendy come from um well my mom just died about a year and a half ago it was mm-hmm. horrible i was mm-hmm. uh, sort of uh, impacted by covid but she had lots of she was 89 so she wasn't a spring chicken mm-hmm. and there were lots of uh ailments and so on <clears throat> including increasing dementia so the the decline was was gradual which made it easier but it would have been in some ways because she disappeared gradually um but also made it harder because it would have been nice to have her fully there until the end but there were a lot of things when she was alive that I you know I thought were like sort of her stories and at CBC you're not really encouraged to be a you know to tell all your stories and you know it used to be that uh uh, gay marriage. Maybe it is still an issue for some people. It hasn't been an issue for me for a long time that I think people should be able to marry whoever the hell they want to marry and get whatever benefits. And, and, and if they, you know, they want to have sex with somebody other than what uh, their grandparents thought they should have, how they should have sex, then that's, that's all fine with me. But, uh, it was sort of my mom's secret that she had that the reason that her marriage didn't work out was because he was interested in men. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he wasn't really interested in paying child support. And uh, yeah, and I was conceived on sort of a a miracle evening. And, um, and uh, I think Paul Newman was involved um, on the screen somehow. Oh, yeah. So yeah, anyway, so here I am. um, But they divorced very shortly after I was born. Well, they didn't divorce. It took her seven years to get a divorce because of the custody thing. um, And, and all of that. And yeah, so so that made her different, uh, made me different growing up. It was always just me and my mom because she never, uh, she never remarried. It took her forever to uh, to get the divorce, and she was different to start with. In that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, her dad had said, "Why would a woman ever go to university? What a waste!" Her mother basically had to. Great give up being a teacher because she got married. And uh, Mm -hmm. so therefore you've got a man looking after you now. So, um, you know, make room for a man in the job. All these are alien concepts today. And yet there's still lots of inequality that we, uh, that we see in terms of men and women. And obviously in terms of, of uh, diversity and racism and bigotry towards all kinds of people, we could still improve a lot. Um, but yeah, she raised me differently. So, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't baptized. She never took me to the dentist. She stuck me on the bus. She just, you know, it was just like, yeah, you'll survive. Come on. Why, why can't you keep up? And, uh, she was a little extreme. She was a little blunt. She would tell people, uh, like, why'd you marry that guy? What a jerk. So (laughs) yeah, like you, you, you don't, you don't say those things. So she wasn't perfect. 
Um, but she was very much a woman of ill repute. And the piece that I wrote for the Globe started with a rather catchy, if I do pat myself on the back, um, <laughs> um, started with the, so my mother was a hooker. Um, of course she wasn't, but that's what I thought because I found her undies under the couch oh my <laughs> in gosh. grade five, which I guess was about the time when she started dating again. And guess what? Um, but in those days, if you weren't married and you were doing it, then hopefully you were making money, or at least that's how the refrain ran. So I, oh, wow. I told somebody at school and then all of a sudden, not only were we poor, but uh, living in a rich neighborhood, but my mother was a hooker. So uh, yeah, I was kind of raised with a massive chip on my shoulder that I'm still yeah. carrying around yeah. today. Um, yeah. But I think everybody's got a chip, right? It's, and it's just about trying to listen and learn to other people and, and acknowledge that uh, uh, some people are really lucky, but most people have a, a chip of some kind. So I just, I just basically wanted to to say to honor my mom. So the the piece in the Globe ran on um, uh, Mother's Day. Yes. Uh, so it wasn't so much a promo for the show, but it was sort of an explanation of of me um, and honoring my mom. So who was a pretty extraordinary extraordinary woman who raised me to be a, a woman of ill repute in an ironic, appreciative fashion. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, you've always had a lot of spunk. That's for sure. Um, you've always had a, a, an independent, I mean, you are you, you're, you're, you're a character. You know what I mean? Um, we always used to think there goes Wendy. Wow. What she, what she, what is she going to uh, blow up today? Or what is she going to really prod and bring forth today? And you did, you, you brought forth a lot of very interesting stories and, and you were afraid of, you were absolutely fearless. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid of, I wasn't afraid of anybody really, uh, except that I was uh, like Montreal was very different, as you know, in those mm -hmm. days. So you arrive from Toronto and I had my grade 10 French, which was pretty useless, <laughs> um, just enough to persuade my bosses at CTV that I spoke French, which I didn't, um, but they didn't care. I mean, I covered the first referendum. Mm -hmm. I was there for six months. And mm -hmm. I covered the first, like, what a joke. I shouldn't be doing that. By the time <laughs> the second referendum came around 20 years later, I was, uh, I was bilingual and living in Ottawa. But, uh, but yeah, I wasn't afraid of anything except that to cross Saint Laurent, to cross the main, uh, to the French part of town in Montreal, knowing that I couldn't speak French very well. I was terrified. And now yeah. my daughter, who doesn't speak French, and I don't want to go into detail about her life, but she lives on the French side of town and doesn't speak hardly any French, and it's all changing. And then we wonder why there's all of these uh, language bills happening. Mm -hmm. It's because mm -hmm. like French is, it's disappearing. It's, it is, it is disappearing. And there are people who want to save it and people go to various extremes to to do that so anyway i, w I was fearless except for that <laughs> <laughs> well you know you you carried it off you definitely carried it off and uh i you know i never you know sometimes uh, on our side of the media uh of the media line if you like uh, in the english media uh when you go to a big press conference and all the french reporters are there you know they they, they nod at you or whatever or or they would, you know, go like that if they didn't think, if they didn't think you understood what was going on. And I never saw a hint of that when, whenever you were around. So, well, so I you, fooled you, you then. Yes, you did. Because I, I used to wait until the, because when I first moved there, uh, the tradition was, and probably isn't that different today, is that the person would give their uh thing in french and then the yep. french reporters would ask them questions and then the yep. english reporters would get to and it was only when the english reporters asked a question i would like oh that's oh, what that's, this is all that's about. what they meant <laughs> yeah. yeah i, I figured it out eventually but i used to listen to cjd uh yes. in montreal and go oh okay that's what the news is i eventually you know was able to write my own headlines but at the beginning it was very much a learning process well, that's for sure. And uh, well, it didn't scare you off. I mean, uh, you could no. have run away. You could have run away after like the first two weeks, but you did not. You persisted. No, I thought it was it was like being a foreign correspondent in a uh, without leaving the country. It was amazing yeah. the opportunity. Yeah. yeah, I just found it fascinating. So many stories, political yeah, sure. and personal. You know, well, not my personal, but uh, about life. Well, I guess your first big step uh, away from Montreal was to Quebec City, right? To yeah. cover the... Uh, yeah, because nobody else wanted to go. 
Wow. It was amazing. Like in the CBC newsroom, like who wants to go and live in like Frenchie town? And I was like, well, I, <laughs> I do. Like the, the separatist premier is uh, René Levesque is, uh, is in charge. What a great story. And it's beautiful. Who wouldn't want to live there? And so, yeah, so I, um, and you move there and like nobody speaks any English. And so no, my, my French became very good, very quickly. Yes, yes. And what were your impressions of, of René Levesque? when he was a premier and you were I, in the press gallery. Yeah, I, I, I just thought he was wonderful. You know, he was sort of the last bastion of maybe Pierre Trudeau was was like that, too. I never got to cover him, really. Uh, but René Levesque, I saw every day and he would get mad and he would make fun of us. And he used to be a journalist. He was at Radio yep. Canada yep. and um, he was like a real person. And he'd stop and like think about your question instead of, you know, like every leader since. <laughs> basically certainly in ottawa they basically doesn't matter what you ask, ask them they give you the same sort of rote answer so he was great to, to cover and i remember asking robert borassa uh who was premier after him was a liberal leader and yes. uh, involved in meech and all of that and i got to know him really well and his people and i asked him do you do you think that rene levesque do you think that he really wanted to take quebec out of the country and he said no i don't think so i think he just wanted more powers um mm -hmm. So I just, uh, anyway, you, uh, I, I wish, I, I moved to Ottawa after uh, Quebec City and covered Brian Mulroney and oh right. my God, what a, what a change. Like Brian Mulroney, who had been all of the journalists' best friends and used to go drinking with all of them. He, he moves to Ottawa and he has to stand behind a podium and there's a chain to hold us back. And it's just, <laughs> yeah. So, so I think of Levesque fondly, not for what he tried to do to Canada, but for how he was to cover. And Mulroney you found quite different. Well, depending on what time your time period you're talking about, right? Yeah. So I had met Mulroney because when I was working for CTV in Montreal, he was uh, other than Heward Grafty, who was known as the gnome from Brom, as if that would be allowed <laughs> right. today. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah. Uh, so I was off doing a story on the gnome from Brom, Heward Grafty, and. Uh, because he was the only conservative and CFTO was really, CF, CTV was really interested in conservatives and he was the only one in the province. And uh, and then Brian Mulroney, conservative, uh, had been beaten by Joe Clark and was still really angry about that and was working his way back up. So I knew him in Montreal when he was like a carouser with the boys, uh, mostly the boys, and, um, and then moved to Ottawa. And then either the boys went to work for him um <clears throat> as some of them the journalists did um uh or he just decided well if you're not writing that i'm a genius then you're an asshole and i was like that's <laughs> not how journalism works it's not either genius or asshole it's you know it's ask hard questions about about issues that matter and uh so yeah i mean i think he's a very very intelligent guy but uh but it was sort of the end of a uh end of an era in terms of journalism and and the uh, prime minister's office yes yes because it became like the everything was centralized and everything was controlled from that uh, that bunker right from then on yeah well and apparently like i wasn't there during the pierre trudeau years but apparently it started then as well but mulroney came in and it was all well it's for all the liberal hacks and the civil service i got to get rid of all of them but it was probably the same for when trudeau went in either everybody wants to be surrounded by their friends right and you also uh, of course uh, followed monsieur chrétien once yeah. he got in there he's and... such a character yeah, yeah I... I know yeah so my, I guess this is echoes of my mother, but I actually asked him on camera once about his facial paralysis <laughs> that everybody wrote about and talked about, but nobody yes. ever asked him about. No, well, why not ask? Yeah. So anyway, maybe I shouldn't have, but he was pretty forthcoming about it. He says, yeah, I got this stupid face thing and it makes it uncomfortable for people and people like to comment on it, but I'm still the same on the inside. And it's just, you know, I've learned to, to deal with it. And I talked through this ear over here because this ear works better and this side of my mouth moves better um yeah he was a real he was a real character i mean the the, the best story about him was a lawrence martin story who's the washington correspondent still i think for uh, the globe mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he wrote a story about how cretin at some point didn't uh, want to write his exams for law school and said oh i got a pain in my stomach oh oh and his mom was like, no, you're going to write the stupid exams. And um, no, oh, 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 oh. and he ended up having surgery 
Wow. And there was saying he had appendicitis. He had no appendicitis. He just wanted to get out of the oh, exams. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So pig-headed, a little pig-headed. But, uh, you know, I think we admire that if we admire what the person is is fighting for. But, I mean, they all had they all had flaws and they all had, like the rest of us, they all had uh, good parts and bad parts. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you hosted a lot of different programs and co-hosted. Like I, I certainly remember you on Marketplace with uh, Erica Johnson, and uh, that was a very well. It was a very. It's still a very good program, but it was an excellent program there with you two guys on it. And uh, and you had Undercurrents, uh, which yeah, is yeah. Undercurrents was sort of my baby. Marketplace came afterwards. It was after they canceled Undercurrents because it was you know we used to take on advertisers and journalists, so that didn't sort of make us any friends in the ivory towers anywhere mm -hmm. cbc mm -hmm. or or outside um so i went to marketplace after they killed undercurrents um and it wasn't really you know chasing crooked contractors wasn't really my thing but i think that's um i think it's important and mm -hmm. i loved the people that i worked with at marketplace and erica johnson is like amazing um but undercurrents was my baby so the idea there was to sort of apply the investigative journalism that everybody was trying to do in Ottawa and Quebec City and whatever, um, legislatures everywhere, journalism everywhere, uh, to marketing and media and, uh, and technology. And it was before social media, it was before, it was really just the, the internet was just starting to explode, it was in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and I got to work with a bunch of really smart people and we told all kinds of stories that are, you know, about data mining and privacy and uh, uh, branding and uh, PR and the beginning of beginnings of the internets and the dangers and the glories. And <clears throat> it was just, it was so much fun and it was some of the best reporting that, that I ever did. So we did that for uh, uh, five years and then I did Marketplace for about five years and then I went to the National uh, for about five years with a whole bunch of promises that about half of them came true, which is not bad, I suppose. No, really. Well, you were hosting every weekend. I remember that you were the Sunday night host for sure. And you yeah. always were filling in, right? Yeah. So I ended up, uh, so Peter would take a lot of time off in July and August, sort of like summertime for people. And I would fill in then. And then I ended up doing Fridays too. And then Sundays we would do a panel and I would do an interview. Um, Anthony Bourdain, Idris Elba. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, just really interesting interesting sort of celebrities I never done celebrities before but at least I got to do interesting people except that I was always sort of uh, secretly in love all my crushes were on comedians as opposed to uh, <laughs> movie stars and they're terrible interviews like John Stewart and I ended up fighting but really? um, <clears throat> yeah well he did this movie um he gave up on the daily for six months to do this movie mm -hmm. and it was about a guy that he had uh on his show an iranian making fun of iran and then the guy gets thrown in prison and evan prison in iran and then john stewart does this movie and so i asked what i thought was a pretty obvious question so uh guilt hello and he was like no i'm just a journalist like screw you and uh anyway then we ended up fighting over <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're not best friends it seems that's too bad but that's he is a bad. journalist he's a he's a secret journalist so is that right i think so well have yeah. you seen his new show it's all it's all about meaning it's not even funny really <clears throat> yeah. so anyway yeah wow well um what were you doing at the last uh, the last thing that you were doing was uh well uh so i was doing a show called the weekly yeah. which was a, a weekly show. Um, so I worked first with uh, Zev Shalev, um, sort of a child genius, um, uh, who's now doing his own thing on, um, like he ended up doing one of the morning shows and for one of the big networks in the States with a budget of $70 million a year nice. uh, at 28 or whatever he was. So it's, uh, uh, and now he's doing his own show. Um and then I worked with uh, Suzanne, uh, Susan Treen, um, who was also a really good producer and, and, a, and a very small crew. But it was great because we got to do investigative journalism um, uh, for a weekly show and uh, to try and like that's always been my thing in journalism is you can turn on media anywhere, any, any you know, in any era and get sort of the headlines. But Tell me something I don't know. That's my routine exactly. was always, tell yeah. me something I don't know. Make me think of a new thought. Present me with somebody else's argument. 
and then present me with the opposing argument and then, you know, and make it interesting. So that's what I tried to do. So that's what we tried to do on, on the weekly was to take a story to a, a different level and, and make people <clears throat> think about things. So I did that for, I don't know, three or four years and then um, it ended badly. So, yeah, yeah, it did. Um, and uh, it was, it was very unfortunate. Um yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk about what mm -hmm. what happened. I mean, basically, mm -hmm. it was it was a confluence of, if that's a word, of of events of um, <clears throat> uh, George Floyd had just been murdered um, yes. by the police in the states, and this is like two years ago almost. And we were doing a panel about uh, racism in Canadian journalism, and mm -hmm. it was to be an anti-racist show, basically. And so I would we think were, so. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a phone call and and COVID was was new and everybody was freaked out about that. So everybody was working from home and we were on a phone call and we brought in uh, I was basically three people who I'd worked with for a number of years or a couple of years anyway. Um, all all great. And we brought in a, a freelancer who didn't know me, um, but who. Uh, knew the story and we thought could help on the story. So we're on a phone call and we're discussing a panelist that we were going to have on and how she had been, she wasn't on the panel ultimately, um, uh, how she said that she had been repeatedly called the N-word. And I was like, I was so upset about this. And so we were pl planning the, the panel and I used the whole word and and the and it, the room kind of went quiet because I guess my boss knew that you're not supposed to use that word, which I didn't know, but I should have known. Um, not to ever call anyone that. Like I would never in a million years. I have never would never call anyone that. Uh, and it wasn't on the air. It was just on a phone call. But, but still, I shouldn't have used the word. And so I apologized immediately when I realized that I had hurt people. And then I apologized publicly. And then the CBC um, felt that they had to do something about it. So they had this long history of, you know, like two weeks earlier, they'd been called the, the, um, a bastion of systemic racism. There'd been all kinds of promises made to the diversity and um, equality and inclusion or committee or whatever it is. Um, and those promises had not been followed up on. And, and if you looked at the um, uh, management, and particularly senior management, it was all old white people, which to some extent makes sense, but um, like there was no represent, no proper representation of anything at all different. And, um, and so during COVID, in the wake of George Floyd, me using the word, all of a sudden, the, the 40 years of me fighting to tell important stories about underdogs and being a good journalist and also the news of the day, um, all of that was basically thrown out the window and I was used, I was basically thrown under the bus by my employer of, of decades and, uh, and used to make the case that, uh, you know, they didn't have a racism problem, that I was a problem. So it, it really hurt. It really, really, really hurt. It was completely overblown. I should have been punished, forgiven and moved on. And that's not at all what happened. Yeah, it was really rough. And, uh, it, it became this huge controversy everywhere yeah. on Twitter and uh, throughout social media and people were writing newspaper columns galore about it and so on. And, so and meanwhile, forth. I wasn't allowed to talk, right? Because mm -hmm. I was, it's all sort of run by the union um, and the HR committee and it, there's this Byzantine process and you're not allowed to speak. So I couldn't even fight back. So, you know, I should have just quit and fought back. Um, but I was like, what I did is not that bad. I have this, like, I have apologized, I have learned, and I'm prepared to be punished for it. But, but really, you're gonna, like, throw me in the garbage after, uh, after 40 years. And I just, so I, I didn't, I should have fought back, but I didn't. So here I am, it took me a year later, and I, they wanted to basically place a gag order on me to give me some kind of severance or whatever and uh, and I was like I'm not that doesn't make <laughs> like that doesn't make sense wow. that doesn't make sense so it, it took it took a long time so so now like that's not what me and Maureen are going to talk about like the podcast is has absolutely nothing to do with that the women of ill repute like it's not because of what happened at CBC that I'm a woman of ill repute I've been one forever <laughs> <laughs> and most of us are in one way or another um uh, or men of ill repute or non-binary people of Ill, whatever you know we're all we're all just 
there's no such thing as normal. So anyway, that's not what our, that's not what our podcast is about. Our podcast is, is about uh, everything else that, uh, that I've tried to uh, bring about in my life, which is a little fun, a little knowledge, a little open debate. And uh, yeah, and we're, we're having fun. We're talking to so many people and solving all the problems of the world. Of course, <laughs> you have all the solutions right there. Yes. So no desire to get back like on, on TV or anything? No, no, no. I'm like, I'm in my early sixties and I've discovered that there are stars in the sky. I mean, who mm -hmm. knew? Um, I have like friends, even a couple of friends who are not in the business. Like who knew that like Amazing. there's people I know. And I actually have yeah. time. Like I remember when I left Ottawa, uh, unfortunately I then went to a show where I worked 10 hours a day, six days a week, uh, undercurrents. And then I started doing the national and marketplace and then that was six days a week. So, but I remember leaving Ottawa where it was seven days a week of 10 or 12 hours a day and saying, Oh, now I can actually buy tickets to something. I can yeah. say to my mom or to a girlfriend, uh, or a husband or whatever, let's, you know, let's buy tickets to something and actually go. Um, so now, you know, now I can do that. So Maureen and I, we basically put the podcast on hold. If she's doing a trip up the guest BZ, or if, if I'm doing, go, I'm going surfing in Cape Hatteras or whatever, we just put everything on hold for two weeks and we're, we're sort of in charge. So no, I have like, if someone throws a whole lot of money at me and gives me complete control and I only have to show up two days a week. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> somehow, somehow that's not happening. So, uh, so I'm, I'm actually very happy to do, uh, to do this podcast and, and, uh, I don't have to, I don't have to feed people anymore. I've, uh, you know, I've sort of, I did that for 45 years and my daughter's now an adult. So it's, uh, we're good. Well, it sounds like you're in a, in a pretty good place. I know, uh, you know, it must've been very, very rough. Uh, do you feel like you've healed from it? Healed? Yeah. Uh, it really hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really hurt. Um, and it really hurt that, you know, because I, I, I couldn't talk or didn't choose to quit and fight and call a bunch of people assholes, which I didn't because I, I believe in change and I didn't believe in attacking some of the people who had attacked me because, because uh, what did they know and, and like growing up there was just, uh, it was just crazy some of the stuff that we grew up with the way that we talked about uh, people who weren't like us. Well, maybe I didn't, but but there was certainly a lot of chatter about gay people or we knew nothing about residential schools. So I actually I think that I think the change is I think change is good. You know, I think that I think trans people, you know, um, should be able to be seen as people. Um, so I think I think a lot of the changes is, is good. And I and I didn't want to go out and try and attack people who had attacked me not knowing what on earth had happened. Um, but yeah, it, it hurt a lot. And what hurt the most, I suppose, was some people, even educated media people, not that people outside of media aren't educated, but mm -hmm. I mean, educated in media crap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thinking that I had actually called somebody that like I would never in a million years. And I think anyone who's ever known me or worked with me knows that. Um, so, so yeah, I did, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm really happy to be doing this podcast with Maureen, Women of Ill Repute, and I'm happy to be living my life and I'm happy not to be working 60 hours a week uh, anymore. And um, yeah, and I'm, and I'm happy to have been raised by the woman I was raised by to be, you know, the, the, the person that I am still fighting, but not fighting quite as hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you seem to be in a, in a pretty good place uh, for, for this juncture and for moving on. And I'm sure, I'm sure that, you know, it's really going to go well for you. As, well, I hope so. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, right, right now, Maureen and I are doing all of the work and uh, spending all of the money. Not that you, you can do it on the cheap, but it doesn't mean anyone will listen. But you, <laughs> yeah. you can, I know uh, I'm out here by myself somewhere. I know. Yeah. So we, you know, we do, we do most of the work ourselves and then we have uh, some help in uh, posting episodes and doing websites and stuff. So we'll, you know, we'll see how it goes. But uh, yeah, it's it's really interesting, and the and the chats with the people that we've done so far are um, they're very loose and very emotional, and lots of chuckles and a couple of tears, and it's just uh, yeah, it's 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 great. It's nice to 
not work for somebody anymore. So not that yeah. it was always yeah. terrible. It was it was mostly good. Yeah. Well, I, I know I've been doing uh, these for a few months and uh, uh, the feeling of being in charge, <clears throat> pardon me, of your own product is really, really exhilarating, really. Yeah. And we're old <clears throat> now, so we, why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> we can do what we want. <laughs> well, it's been fantastic talking to you. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time and I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that. I've been one of the first to be able to do this. I really, I, I really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I, I just wish you all, all the best. And, uh, well, thank you, Bill. I, I very much appreciated your fighting for me when this was going on. Cause a lot of people didn't have the guts to publicly, like a mm -hmm. lot of people did privately, but, uh, um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's why I'm here because, because we have a history and because, uh, you reached out at a, at a time when not a lot of people were reaching out. So I'm very appreciative of that. Well, you are, uh, you're worth the effort kid. No, oh, thanks Bill. No, it's been nice. Nice to see your face. Yeah, it's nice to see you. And, and again, we wish you uh, all the success in the world and, uh, another time. <laughs> yeah, I'll see we'll you talk 30. again. <laughs>